So a couple of days after MCP first released, um, I shared my first integration with MCP. Um, I'd written an MCP server to generate images, um, and I'd now used Claude Desktop to combine it with the Fetch server and produce cat dioramas of the day's current events. Okay? And even if you'd been using um, APIs to sort of connect up tools and so on, there's still a real kind of sense of magic that you get when you see an LLM figure out how to combine different tool calls together and actually produce something, um, produce something quite worthwhile. And of course, the great thing about tools is they're a very, very easy way for MCP server developers to get, to get information into the context, right? So we have tool descriptions which help inform the LLM how to use the tool. And then, of course, we have tool results, which let us just dump content you know, pretty much straight into the context window. OK, so it's a, you know, a pretty, pretty straightforward thing to do. And of course, we've seen a real explosion of tool adoption. And I think you know, another reason for this is because there's a great symmetry between the MCP tool calling interface and the completions and messages APIs that are behind them. OK, so it's relatively straightforward for client applications, uh, you know, be they web user interfaces or agent frameworks to actually, um, to actually use the tools. So, you know, as I think David mentioned, we've, there's well over 10,000 MCP servers listed on the registries. Why are they so popular? Well, I think one of the reasons is they require virtually zero coordination between the MCP server developer and the host application developer. All we need to have done is agree that we're going to use MCP as our communication protocol, and we're good to go. And actually, we can let the LLM figure everything else out. So they, they come with some, with some level of drawbacks. I'm going to share a bit of data. I've reproduced this enough times I'm confident to. But um, tool descriptions and call results consume context. So I ran a, a short experiment here, which was to set an agent up and then to search for papers on the Hugging Face Hub, then find out if there's any models for it, and then find out if I could use any of those models if they were hosted on Spaces. So three fairly straightforward instructions, and I just ran it in two different scenarios. One was with the search tool that I wanted to use directly, and the second, and I think a lot of us commonly do this, was with some additional servers, so I used the official um, file system server and the official GitHub server. Right, and I ran that 20 times and thought, right, well, let's see how those two different things perform. And actually, what, what we find is this is with Sonnet 3.7. It's amazing watching Sonnet 3.7, you know, search the hub and find all the various different papers. But with those extra tools in context, it, it, it took 47% longer to actually run on average and consumed, you know, nearly twice the number of tokens. So this is, you know, this is clearly something that we kind of need to care about and think about as we're architecting and designing these types of applications. At the beginning of this month as well, um, Microsoft and Salesforce Research shared this paper um, called, uh, uh, talking about when LLMs get lost in conversation. And what they've done is compare um, how well a number of LLMs perform given a very well-specified task versus various a number of conversation terms. And they find that the reliability and, um, and kind of cleverness of LLMs drops significantly in a multi-turn multi conversation. Usually, or what they're testing for is under-specification of the original task. Okay? And so that, that causes us some real challenges. So you know, when we're integrating with tools, they're not like traditional API responses. We're intending to send them to the LLM. And they become the next turn in the conversation. But, you know, already to kind of manage this tool issue, we can see some user experience patterns emerging. So, for example, uh, between VS Code and the GitHub MCP server, you can kind of dynamically select a bouquet of tools uh, if you know what the user's intent is. Or you can select tools um, from the Claude.ai front end. But these things are actually just transferring or putting an extra burden on the user to actually control the situation. If I've got, you know, 40 or 50 tools to select from, that's actually quite a, quite, a tough, quite a tough ask. So you know, if, if we think about this quickly from the perspective of a host or client application developer, when I get the content back from the tool call, because again, it's quite dissimilar to a traditional API, I kind of need to figure out, well, what am I going to do with this content? 
right? So the question is, is can I render it if I'm a back-end agent framework? Um, you know, it might be the case that I can't, if an image comes in, I can't show it to the user, but I can tokenize it so the LLM can see it. Okay, that's fine. Maybe if I get audio, um, I can render it and have a little play button and people can hear the audio, but I might not be able to send it to the LLM. So I need to kind of figure out what I should, what I should do with this content. And regardless, um, you know, most, of, most things are gonna end up um, coming back or being sent via the API as text plain anyway, right? But the nice thing is that we can actually embed resources and the resources give us the semantics about what to do with, with them. So resources are really, they're, they're very straightforward things, right? They represent text or binary data. They've got a mime type which tells us the shape of the thing and it gives us a UI which tells us basically where to find the thing or what the thing, but also what the thing is. And they're embeddable in prompts and tool results. Okay, so this, this is a quite a nice feature of them because we can then just uh, plump, them, plump them where we need them. And because, because I've got a mind type, I get some pretty good semantics about them, right? So if, for example, um, I see a Python file in its application stroke X Python, it's the host application developer. If I'm writing ID, there's stuff I might want to do to it, yeah? So I might, for example, want to, um, type check it or lint it or do some other things or display it in a special way before I coerce it into text plane for the LLM to tokenize and, and consume. So al alongside that, um, prompts aren't just a way to do instruction templating. Okay, they're actually a very precise way to inject task context. So again, if we kind of care about the performance of our completions and we care about how the performance of our applications, it's really quite useful if we know up front what the user's task intent is so that we can then po uh, populate the prompt with the, right, with the right pieces of context. So, you know, for example, if we've got a, uh, a need to produce a daily task list, my design options might be to um, give three tools, one which would be, you know, show me my task list, share my calendar for the day, show me the context in the calendar. But those three tool calls chained together would significantly reduce reliability and they consume quite a lot of context space. Right, I can actually just concatenate that context into a single prompt and get far better performance as a result. Okay, so with a bit of thinking, we can, if we know roughly what the user intends are gonna be, we can start to architect and design applications that give us better LLM performance, which ultimately is, um, is what we're gonna to want to do. The other nice thing about prompts is um, they come as user assistant pairs. So we can use them for in-context learning, right? So if we show the LLM examples of, here's what the user said, here's what you said, here's what the user said, we can, we can make things much more predictable. So we can also embed resources into prompts. And so what that means is, is that we can then start to compose some fairly, um, some fairly sophisticated workflows where we can have you know, sequences of instructions with templated resources in place so that we can populate them and reuse them uh, and assemble them in the right way. And again, knowing, you know, roughly knowing the mind type means we can intelligently handle the data. So a quick example, right? Um, if, you want to, if you want to play with this stuff quite easily, um, I've, I've got a project called Fast Agent, which comes with a tool called the Prompt Server. And it can make trying some of these ideas quite easy if you're you know, even easier than to having, <laughs> having Claude produce the code for you. Um, but you know, an example here might be that we've got a user message saying, yeah, can you refactor this code to follow the best practices? We supply as a resource the sample bad file, and then we show the assistant what the output should look like, and then we can give it the real file to refactor, and that will massively improve the LLM's performance at that task. Right? So that's a kind of a fairly basic use of in-context learning, but it helps, you know, give us, helps focus the LLM on the, on the task that we want it to do. There's some additional cool stuff that we can do with resources. So they're subscribable. Um, it's, if the MCP server supports it, we can ask for updates for um, a particular resource. And we might use that to trigger a new generation. Right? If my task list changes, for example, um, I can get a new report on it. I might, for example, if I'm building an IDE, um, have, a, have a resource embedded in context that when it subscribes, I mutate the context with. So my next generation contains that updated information. Again, with a well-crafted context window, those things are all quite possible. 
The other thing that's um, open to us is sampling. Uh, so David mentioned this uh, quite a lot earlier. But we can use sampling at any time in an MCP server. right? So sampling doesn't have to happen during a tool call execution. You can have a button which, um, which triggers sampling. And that means that, for example, you know, if I'm searching for a, a paper on the Kazakh language from the Hugging Face Hub, maybe I've got a resource which brings me the paper down as a PDF, which I can tokenize. Or maybe I use sampling to actually condense the paper into a two or three sentence summary, and then I can feed that into the context window for analysis. So sampling we can use for that kind of um, construction, condensing. We can generate prompts, generate parts user interfaces, all those kind of things. Um, are available to us for sampling. And there's, um, I'll just mention, there's a video with me and um, the Pulse MCP team messing around with some of this stuff um, that, that takes us a bit further. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, it's great if we've understood that the mind types give us the semantics of, of what to do. URI schemes enable MCP server developers and client application builders to coordinate expectations and share understanding. So what does that, what's that kind of mean, right? So the challenge that we have if we're building client or host applications is that we, you know, to build really rich experiences, we kind of want to know a little bit about some of the shape of the data that's coming back or about some of the functionality that the servers might expose. And also, as an MCP server developer, there are things that I might want to be sure or be confident in which uh, to know what the, what the host application is going to do in any particular scenario. So URI schemes let MCP server developers and client application builders share these kind of semantic contracts. Right? So we'll get an idea of, of the layout of things. So for example, you know, if I'm building home automation systems, having a URI scheme which tells me the layout of the, and the, of the type of actions and properties that I need, so I can have resources telling me the state of particular parts of my home, and I can have tools which then give me actions to control it. And if I've used a, a relatively standard scheme, I can share that scheme with, with you know, home automation providers, and I can share that scheme with sensor developers or, or aggregators, and then we can actually start to get a level of interoperability and understanding at a much, a much more semantic level. Right? So, you know, the kind of generic applications where we can plug these things together are great. Um, but, you know, I think we will start to see quite a lot more domain-specific applications uh, come to the fore. Oops. So, um, fortunately, we're allowed to pre present from our laptops um, because if we'd have stuck to the original presentation deadline, I wouldn't have been able to include this. And this is, this is really exciting, um, I think. So... Um, last week, a developer called Ido Salomon um, has kind of launched one of these first schemes, right? So he's actually said, you know, if, for example, the URI includes UI, then what we'll actually do is agree that we'll use an embedded resource from the MCP server to deliver some HTML content and the client to actually render that content um, in place. Now, the nice thing about that is that the scheme lets us you know, know that these things are going to work reasonably well together. And the work he's done, it includes both client and server SDKs. So what we can kind of see here is, is that actually, if I've got an SDK available to use this and consume this URI scheme, then actually I can start to build much more sophisticated servers and hosts much more rapidly because the bits are already in place and start to actually you know, build some quite decent custom applications. So, because you know, if we know about the URI scheme, we can, we can share schemas in advance. So if data comes in as JSON, we're gonna be able to you know, not just parse it, but actually know how to process it and maybe show sorting and filtering to the end users. Um, if we know roughly what the hierarchy of these things is gonna look like, um, then we can start to make you know, much better user experiences. I think um, I've just seen some amazing stuff this morning from Harold with VS Code, which I think you know, supersedes a lot of stuff in this talk. Um, it's going to be amazing. Um, and again, the availability of these types of SDKs uh, is, is you know, I think, going to kind of help build the ecosystem um, to, to give us much, much richer user experiences. Yep. So, you know, resources give us an extra level of semantics beyond just plain text content. Um, 
we can use UI schemes to start to coordinate expectations between the different parts to, to kind of build um, you know, much more sophisticated applications. Um, and again, I think you know, looking at how LLMs perform with multiple tools, with um, you know, multi-turn conversations, it really is worth thinking you know, a little bit more about how we craft and design some of these things. Just the final thing here, um, there's you know, probably a couple of tweaks, minor tweaks to the spec that we'll probably want to look at to make resources a little bit easier to use and consume. Um, I just want to give a call out that the MCP uh, working groups um, is a very, very good place to kind of get involved and collaborate on these, on these kind of questions and, and comments. So, um, list of resources are probably made available somehow, or maybe someone can pause that if they're interested on the, on the YouTube later. And with that, I will bid you farewell. Hope to meet a number of you later during the day, and thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs>